Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, the second in the series of poetry. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, for the uh, Black Heritage Trail, the Black Matter is Life, poetry for engagement and overcoming. And if you have some questions about uh, the series, information about it is available on our website, as are links to the poems that will be read tonight. Uh, we, we promote awareness and appreciation of African-American history and life in order to build more inclusive communities today. And we explore in this series, the rich tradition and, innov and innovations that are found in African-American poetry. Tonight's session, the theme is in protest. We examine familiar literary tropes of protest and resistance in the African-American writings. Tonight, we will be discussing James Weldon Johnson's The Creation, Audre Lorde's Litany for Survival, Donez Smith's Dear White America, and Elizabeth Alexander's Ars Poetica, number 1002, Rally. 
Um, so without any further introduction, forgive me everyone. I will turn things over to Dennis Britton. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, and actually, before you turn it over to me, uh, Gina has a couple of housekeeping matters. Everyone, good evening. Um, thanks for joining us. I just wanna do a couple of um, technical housekeeping real quick. Um, I would like to ask everyone to please keep themselves muted um, during the discussion portion of the um, of this uh, event this evening. We will um, ask everyone to unmute their mics uh, later on for the Q and A. If you have any questions or comments um, while the poets are talking, we um, you can use the chat. Um, we'll have uh, someone moderating questions and comments and to our, our um, speakers during the event. And if you have any IT problems, um, any technical questions, you can put that in the chat. If you can pref preface it with the letters IT, um, our IT team will be on the lookout for that and we will contact you privately to try to help you out. All right, um, I'm gonna send it back to Dennis now. All right, thank you very much, Gina. Well, but before Dennis goes on, I can also introduce our, Dennis is one of the two facilitators. Sorry about that. The other is Reginald Wilburn, who is both Dennis and Reggie, uh, or doctor, doctors Wilburn and Britton are uh, English professors at our state school, University of New Hampshire. Now, Dr. Britton. Well, thank you. I'm going to co-opt the moment and hopefully Dennis doesn't mind. Uh, protest. Have some poems about him. Want to hear? Here it go. And God stepped out on space and he looked around and said, I'm lonely. I'll make me a world. And far as the eye of God could see, Darkness covered everything, blacker than a hundred midnights down in a cypress swamp. Then God smiled and the light broke and the darkness rolled up on one side and the light stood shining on the other. And God said, that's good. Then God reached out and took to the light in his hands and God rolled the light around in his hands until he made the sun. And he set that sun ablazing in the heavens and the light that was left from making the sun, God gathered it up in a shining ball and flung it against the darkness, spangling the night with the moon and stars. Then down between the darkness and the light, he hurled the world and God said, that's good. Then God himself stepped down and the sun was on his right hand and the moon was on his left. The stars were clustered about his head and the earth was under his feet and God walked and where he trod his footsteps hollowed the valleys out and bowled the mountains up. Then he stopped and looked and saw that the earth was hot and barren. So God stepped over to the edge of the world and he spat out the seven seas. He batted his eyes and the lightnings flashed. He clapped his hands and the thunders rolled and the waters above the earth came down. The cooling waters came down. Then the green grass sprouted and the little red flowers blossomed. The pine tree pointed his finger to the sky and the oak spread out his arm. The lakes cuddled down in the hollows of the ground and the rivers ran down to the sea and God smiled again and the rainbow appeared and curled itself around his shoulder. Then God raised his arm and he waved his hand over the sea and over the land. And he said, bring forth, bring forth. And quicker than God could drop his hand, fishes and fowls and beasts and birds swam the rivers and the seas, roamed the forests and the woods and split the air with their wings. And God said, that's good. 
Then God walked around and God looked around on all he had made. He looked at his sun and he looked at his moon and he looked at his little stars. He looked on his world with all its living things. And God said, I'm lonely still. Then God sat down on the side of a hill where he could think. By a deep, wide river he sat down. With his head in his hands, God thought and thought till he thought, I'll make me a man. Up from the bed of the river, God scooped the clay. And by the bank of the river, he kneeled him down. And there the great God Almighty, who lit the sun and fixed it in the sky, who flung the stars to the most far corner of the night, who rounded the earth in the middle of his hands, this great God, like a mammy beholding, bending over her baby, kneeled down in the dust, toiling over a lump of clay till he shaped it in his own image. Then into it he blew the breath of life and man became a living soul. Amen. 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 What in the world does this have to do with protest, my dear brother Dennis Britton? Johnson has the audacity to retell Genesis <laughs> as a black man, right? And not only that, to put it in the language of black folks, right? You know, you can hear a black preacher um, in the poem. Um, and this is not your King James English, right? This is black people's English. This is the black <laughs> preacher's English, right? That itself is already a form of protest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I guess as I think about that, you know, I can't help but think that the composition of this poem is also the period where the Negro spiritual is coming into vogue, right? And so this sense in which you're talking about the black vernacular, there's a sense in coming into the 20th century, there can be shame around being thought of as primitive and playing into the stereotype of blacks as primitive. And so there's a sense in which there can be this shame associated with the Negro spiritual in an age where black folk are trying to create their space of citizenship and earn their space of citizenship. Um, and so this celebration, if you will, of black vernacular and vernacular forms, um, I think is a protest to dignify it even, right, um, with black vernacular. Um, I think is a protest in and of itself, a sort of linguistic or poetic uh, protest. Yeah, yeah, that our language, right, has the, like like God, right, has the ability to bring things into being, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, I think you, know, you think about, you know, the, the word magic, right? You know, mm -hmm. you, you, you say the word, the thing comes into existence, right? And, mm -hmm. right, and that this is, you know, the word of God is the word of black folks. So the black folks, you know, can speak like God and God speaks like black folks, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that's part, I, I agree, like that's part of the protest, right? That's part mm -hmm. of dignifying the ways in which black people speak, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think that's also what makes this poem so beautiful. Yeah, and to black in the religion, right? To black in the white Christ and the white God, right? Um, which cannot be really held on to from uh, a three-fifths human sensibility, mm -hmm. if you will. Right. That religion will not work. Right. And so that Christianity has to be refashioned and remade. And so you do it with the tongue, the eloquence of the tongue. Right. And so right. blackening America's white God. Right. As its own protest. And I think as we read the poem. Right. It opens up these doors for like the theater of performance. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you can't just read these words. You have to perform them consonant with black preaching tradition. Right. 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 Right, I almost got carried away, but I didn't, you know. <laughs> I could have put a couple of hers in there, you know. Yeah, but you're uh -huh. right, that you're right. This is a poem, I think you're right, that, you know, and right, because you know, you know, um, African-American culture is such an oral culture, right? There's such mm -hmm. an oral component, right? And the, as you noted, the performative, right? Yes. Um, right, that you, you can't just sort of say, and God said, let there be, <laughs> right? That mm -hmm. you sort of have to fully embody. Yes. Right? Like, you know, the mm -hmm. poem needs to be embodied in all that, all the ways in which black people perform oratory, yes, right yes. in the black church and you know mm -hmm. in other spaces, that all that is coming into Johnson's poem here. Um, it's, interesting, it's interesting that you bring up the oratorical and the black church, right? Because 
as we all know, this is one of the poems from God's Trombones, a collection of mm -hmm. sermonic poems where James Welder Johnson refashioned biblical stories in the vernacular of the folk black people. But these poems were really popular, especially like, you know, my parents' day and my grandparents' days, right? And so when we talk about the children's day programs where children had to come to the front and recite their poems and work the audience, right? This is one of those poems that was made for performing. You would almost find it always on a children's day program at, at church to be performed. Right, right. No, you're right that this poem, I think you're right, this poem has a particular place in African-American uh, culture and, you know, African-American Christianity, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the poem, you, you know, that you, if you went to church, you know, a black church, you were likely to have heard, I think you said kids for reciting it. Yes. Um, right, and it has that double function, right? It, it, it um, inspires, right? It, you know, it, it passes on the sort of black oratory throughout generations, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it inspires confidence in black children, I think, right? You know, to be able to sort of recite these stately words, mm -hmm. um, but they're also words that are, you know, their own, right? Yes. Um, yes. You know, I just, you know, you know, one of the things, you know, you definitely can see the, the, or, the black oratory in it, you know, um, we see anaphora, right? That's a fancy term for <laughs> the repetition of a single word or repetition of a word or phrase at the beginning mm -hmm. of lines, right? Mm -hmm. So in the third stanza, we get, then God smiled and the light broke and the darkness rolled on one side and the light stood on, right? And God said, right? That's sort of, you know, that's a very, you know, recognizable rhetorical move. Uh-huh, that's high preaching right there. You're feeling it. Yeah, right there. I'm <laughs> Right. And then even, you know, just the diction that, you know, I think the verbal parallelism that you're talking about, um, you know, and the darkness rolled up on one side and the light stood shining on the other. Um, the God reached out and took the light in his hands. Right. Um, all of those moments. Right. They actually add to the performance. Right. In, in terms of a recitative poem. Right. These are those subtle rhetorical mnemonic de devices that helps the person to perform and remember the lines. Right. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the imagery of, you know, the the spangling, what is it, the spangling the night with the moon and stars, right? Making the star spangled banner a verb, right? Spangling the night with the moon and stars. I just think it's just a, a really poetic and powerful uh, choice of words. Yeah, I mean, do you, have such, any, do you have any that kind of resonated with you? Yeah, I think there's such, so many just beautiful phrases and beautiful images. You know, I love, you know, and God smiled and the rainbow appeared. Yes. Right? God smiles a lot in this poem, which I also like, right? This is a very, you know, personal God, you know, he wants people, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, like, you know, yeah, you know, like, yeah, he, this is, yeah, it's a, God has a personality here, right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love the, he batted his eyes and the lightnings flashed. He clapped his hands and the thunders rolled and the waters above the earth came down, the cooling waters came down. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And probably, you know, you know, that that final uh, simile. Yes. I have to talk about that. And then I'm seeing we need to move to the next poem. Uh -huh. but, uh, <laughs> but that final simile, this great God, mm -hmm. like a mammy, mm -hmm. bending over her baby, right? Mm -hmm. The sort of way in which you get the great masculine God, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Being likened to, you know, a figure that's often denigrated, right? The mm -hmm. mammy figure. Yes. Right. Yes. But it also this figure of so he's dignifying that image, right? That 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 persona, that 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 figure, mm -hmm. right? But and that and deifying that figure as well, yes. right? Yes. Right. So a type of poetic protest of how the black woman is figured. Yes. Right? yes. And how the man figure is. So yes. So in terms of litany for survival, right? Um, an interesting poem that I think is it's one of my favorite poems because I see it as existential religious protest, right? How do you protest um, the beingness of being an outcast, of being marginalized in, in, in culture around a variety of different identities, whether you're black, you know, a woman, a black woman, a black queer woman, um, all of these different identities inform um, Audre Lorde, right? And she is the celebrated, right, um, poet in our tradition. Um, and I see this litany for survival as a reckoning with how to be authentically be um, within the clutches of these dynamics that are designed to kill us mm -hmm. on any given day. We are, we are like sheep 
counting for the slaughter, right? If we sort of think about the biblical, the biblical scripture. How does one live on earth when you are the feet counted for the slaughter and were never meant to survive? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, also just, just as a backstory, um, this was the one poem that we all chose, I think, mm -hmm. sort of, right? So we, you know, we sort of were asked, you know, before we were, when we were conceptualizing this program, we were given, um, everybody chooses some, a set of poems, right? And you chose this poem, I had this poem on my list, and Jerry Ann Bogus also had this poem, right? So I think that says something about the power of this poem, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, um, that just surviving, right? Mm -hmm. In a, mm -hmm. in a world, in a, in a country that doesn't want us to survive, as you know, mm -hmm. has been fashioned so that we don't survive, right? Mm -hmm. Just being is itself protest, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's why this poem sort of speaks um, so powerfully, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, you can't talk about African-American protest poetry without thinking about Audre Lorde, right? Right, right, um, right. So it's, it's also quiet in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I think Johnson is, you know, Black preacher, you know, it's loud and Lord is much, you feel like the, the voice is much quieter. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. you know, and what does it mean to give birth to those we know were never meant to live? Right, mm -hmm. I think that's another subtext in the poem. And we look at the prediction again, you know, like bread in our children's mouths, you know, there's a simile there, right? Um, so their dreams will not reflect the death of ours, right? Um, learning to be afraid with our mother's milk mm -hmm. for by this weapon, right, which is supposed to be nurturing, right? But the mother's milk as weapon, right? The illusion of some safety to be found, the heavy footed hope to silence us for all of us this instant and this triumph, we were never meant to survive. And so this use of baby language, baby imagery, maternal imagery, um, how does that add to the meditative litany, right? And yet, being so powerful, nonetheless. Yeah, yeah. I think yes. It's it's, it's the everydayness of it, right? Mm -hmm. Every the, the everyday images, right? Mm -hmm. um, and like, yeah, and the bare necessities of survival, right? Yeah. The ways mm -hmm. in which he's employing those. Um, but also, interestingly, I think you know the the ways in which um, these things that are so everyday, like mother's milk, right, are also mm -hmm. the things that are destroying. Yes. Right. And that simile, learning to be afraid with our mother's milk for by this weapon. Right. So the mother's milk is the weapon. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, this becomes the thing that we're all bred on. Right. We've yeah. all, you know, been, you know, fed upon since the day we were born. Right. And yet that's the thing that is potentially killing us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it also sets up like the what could be our arguably considered a peroration, right? The sermonic discourse, right? That next, what you're talking about, the, the milk that's supposed to be nurturing, but at the same time is the weapon against us. It sets up this string of rhetorical tautologies, right? Mm -hmm. And when the sun rises, we are afraid it might not remain. When the sun sets, we are afraid it might not rise in the morning. When our stomachs are full, we are afraid of indigestion. When our stomachs are empty, we are afraid we may, never, um, we may never eat again. When we are loved, we are afraid love will vanish. When we are alone, we are afraid love will never return. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid, right? And I think that sort of yin and yang, that tit for tat, these rhetorical tautologies, right? Questioning, what do we do, right? How do we live in the paradox? Mm of our situation yeah and we get the gospel in the end right yes so and i love that so it's so it's like so it's sort of like it's kind of nonchalant right mm -hmm. it's better to speak right so if we're in this state of where you know paradox where we seem damned if you do damned if you don't mm -hmm. you might as well say something <laughs> you might as well speak mm -hmm. remembering we were never meant to survive mm -hmm. how would you say that constitutes protest quietly speaking, right, rather than being afraid, right, because the system is meant for us not to speak. It's designed for us to sort of accept um, mm -hmm. the condition, right, or to be afraid to speak. Yes. Because right? on one hand, speaking out would seem to be detrimental to our, our existence. But if, if everything else is already detrimental to our existence, why wouldn't we speak? Right? Mm -hmm. We might as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's something powerful about speaking, right, at the end, right? 
Yeah. You know, you know let there be. You know, yeah. to bring it back to Johnson and to bring it back to Genesis. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, cool. So, do you think now would be a great time to bring in our featured poet? Maybe we could start off by talking about Dennis Smith's poem and. I think now is a perfect time. Okay. All right. So without further ado, everyone, please allow us to introduce a poet who needs no real introduction because she has all of that in a bag of salt and vinegar potato chips. We bring to you and so happy to join, to have join us, Patricia Smith. Just a little bit about who she is, even though if you don't know who she is, you should, and shame on you. <laughs> but she is a poet, teacher, and performance art art artist. She is the author of Incendiary Arts from 2017, which was the winner of the 2018 Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award, and the 2017 Los Angeles Times Book Award in Poetry. Should have been Jimmy Sa uh, Savannah from 2012, was the winner of the 2013 Leonor Marshall Poetry Prize from the Academy of American Poets, which is given for the most outstanding book of poetry published in the United States each year. Her, her book, Blood Dazzler from 2018, was a finalist for the National Book Award. Tea House of the Almighty uh, was the, 20, oh, sorry, the 2005 National Poetry Series selection and the list goes on and on, numerous books, numerous awards. She is an uh, outstanding poet and is a privilege, privilege. I can't even talk, I'm so excited. It's a privilege to have her with us today. Come on in the room, Patricia. <laughs> oh, oh, you're muted, you're muted, Patricia. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I was listening to the conversation and I, and you started to introduce me and I was I was really settled down and I went, I think that might be me. So I should... <laughs> it's great Thank that you recognize you. yourself. So. Very, very happy to be here. Appreciate it. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe we could just begin by talking about, you know, your thoughts on the Donna Smith poem. Maybe we could riff on that for a few minutes. And then we would be remiss if we wouldn't ask you to share some of your poems as well and then discuss those. But sure. any opening thoughts about the Dan S. Smith poem? Uh, well, first of all, I, you know, I wanted to talk about uh, structure for a second, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. he is doing a, a prose poem. There is uh, really no room for you to escape the poem. Mm -hmm. You know, those of you who, who uh, have studied, you know, prosody form, things like that. Uh, if you um, if you have stanza breaks, if you have air between your lines, that's allowing your reader to come in and muse and sit with the lines a little bit. And this is a much more urgent poem mm -hmm. that you may feel like you want to escape, but mm -hmm. then as is the poet does not allow you to do so. It's also interesting that we started out with the creation and now we have someone who's ready to go. Mm. It's like, it's like mm. thanks for earth, it's been nice. <laughs> but, you mm. know, I'm on my way out. Mm -hmm. um, Danez is kind of a master at um, pulling us out of the world that we are in and consistently complaining about and showing us or introducing these, you know, alternate realities. You know, he has a a great poem called Dinosaurs in the Hood, where he's mm -hmm. talking about uh, how these all these movies where people are going to other worlds and finding better things, and they're always all white people, mm -hmm. you know, and he's, the black people are left behind or they're killed in the first scene or something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. But this is calling everybody to task. Mm -hmm. It's saying, you know, we were willing to share this world with you. We're willing to live in a world that treated us as though we belonged here. Mm -hmm. But he brings up in the poem several instances, you know, did we not build your presence? Did we not, do, you know, uh, saying we have earned a place, but after a certain amount of time, you realize that uh, you have decided mm -hmm. that we don't belong. And it's not that we're going to succumb or surrender because of that. We're mm -hmm. going to find our own. Mm -hmm. you know, we're going to find our own place. Uh, and And it's basically... Uh, Danez will not let his readers, um, he won't let his readers rest. He won't let them uh, 
come up with the normal platitudes and say, but Danez, but Danez, you know, hmm. he's very, uh, he's very confrontational in his work. Not only are we out of here, but I'm going to make you sit here and listen to all the reasons, all the been done wrongs, uh, but we're not feeling sorry for ourselves. You know, all the time this has been happening, we've been looking, you know, for someplace new. Uh, and I think it's a poem that once it's done, I mean, he takes you through very quickly um, just these moments in history, you know, he's got, he's got Martin in here, he's got Emmett Till, you know, he's got, you know, various, um, he's got Renisha, he's got the more, the, the uh, things that you see in the headlines now, mm -hmm. of people who are killed uh, often, but not always, you know, at the hands of the state, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and so it's a, it's a real quick history lesson. Of course, there's much, much more of it, but he is picking out the things that are kind of like punches in the gut you know, punches in the gut to say, you know, uh, we're gonna leave you to the world that you've crafted and you might not so be, be so happy being left behind by us. Mm -hmm. I know one of the things that Dennis and I were fascinated by when we were reviewing this poem was to think about the protest that is inherent in the poem simply because of Donna's not subscribing to the binary, the gender binary, right? And so what it means to, to, to not subscribe to the gender binary using third person pronouns um, to claim and authorize space to make this message, right? And to understand these dynamics from the fluidity of gender that maybe those of us who don't live in that space, right, in those spaces, where we are cisgendered males or cisgendered females, what does it mean to go there across the lines through the fluidity of gender and make these pronouncements? And so I think mm -hmm. it's interesting playing, I think who Danez Smith is, their, their use of gender to explore these dynamics across cisgendered identities, I think is just really rebellious. And, and it, it opens up new terrains of thought for us to engage, right? I, I don't know what it's like to be a mother and have to deal with the death of your child, right? Um, I can only sympathize from my cisgendered male body, right? But whether or not Dennis Smith has been a mother, right? The fluidity of gender that encompasses their being and their sense. I think to be able to go there and back and around and across, I think it really ruptures how we think we know what we believe we know. Right, right, that's, that's a good, he, let's see, and they, I'm getting used to this. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, the, the levels of removal, you know, when you say I'm, I'm, a, I'm a black male, I'm a gay black male, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm going to, um, and to say that I have maybe not been accepted in the world that I am, but I feel safer in that world than I do the one that I've chosen to leave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and so mm -hmm. there's there's a lot there are lots of levels there of uh, I will fold myself in the arms of black people before I will trust your arms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, you would think about that because a lot of people that are that he that they are bringing up in the poem, uh, there's lots of different kinds of um, of grief. Yes. And when you think about that, we've had to. There's there's a certain grief in being, you know, Danes. Mm -hmm. There's a certain grief in being, you know, me. There's a certain mm -hmm. grief in in me looking at what's happening to. To, to young black men or transgender women who are, you know, uh, transgender artists who are disappearing. Yes. Uh, so when you're talking before about the Audre Lorde poem, it was kind of like that normalization of fear. Mm. You know, mm. fear this, fear this, fear this. And it's something I kind of wanted to go back on that will connect to both of those poems, I think. Yes. Uh, one of my favorite poets is Gwendolyn Brooks. Yes. And um, I grew up on the west side of Chicago, and that's kind of the part of town everybody tells you to stay away from, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And when you grow up like that, the danger is that your your vision is always over where you are. 
You're mm -hmm. looking for some way out. Mm -hmm. You're looking toward, you know, um, in Chicago, it's, it's a very visual thing. I could look down the main street in my neighborhood and I can see the buildings downtown. And, and I, I was just consumed with, how do I get out of here mm -hmm. and there? And one of the things that, that Gwendolyn taught me was to look at the place I was in, mm -hmm. to listen to those voices, to hold those hands, to see them as family and not as something to escape. Mm -hmm. And in a way uh, that comes into, into play in this poem too. I mean, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of violence in this that everyone should want to escape. Mm -hmm. But you know, he's saying, I'm going to look, they're saying, I'm going to look beyond that to something much greater. This mm -hmm. violence I'm used to, mm -hmm. you know? I've learned to live with this violence. I've learned that this violence is inherent in who you have made us. So I'm taking all of us and your violence and your things you taught us that we only pretended to learn and we're out. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, we're going, we're not, we're not going out to a Mecca that you crafted. We're mm -hmm. going out to one that we've crafted for ourselves when you weren't looking. Yeah. Dennis, what thoughts do you have? I would say I, I, I love what you, I love that comment about the normalizing of fear, right? Mm -hmm. and the, I mean, I just thought, you know, it's just so beautifully and poignantly put. Um, and I love this idea, you know, I've left Earth in search of darker planets, mm -hmm. right? That, you know, this is not like, you know, that, you know, she's looking for a, for, for black planets. So she's looking for a, you know, they, they, like embracing they, of they, darkness. They, 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 look. they, they, they. My bad. Um, yeah. Thank you but, for doing that. I don't feel so bad now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And I yes. And I yes. Um, and I yes. I would intentionally tried to make myself I, that I slipped up. So, um, but yes, that you know there is this real desire, right, um, and an embracing of the dark, right, the thing that is supposed to be abject, the thing that is supposed to be the thing. I think the thing you're supposed to try to get out of, right. Mm -hmm. And there's usually, you know, we want to get out of the dark and we want to get into the light, right? You know, that's a sort of traditional, you know, I think, you know, of course, if you t connect that back to the biblical narrative, there was darkness, God created light. So that's the mm -hmm. sort of genesis of all of that. Um, that. There's a desire instead to get out of the light, to get out of the white, right? And to for the dark, right? So it is a real inversion of mm -hmm. the, the sort of white standards of, of uh, of what is seen and understood as good and holy and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I saw in one of the comments that there's there's definitely a critique of white religion, white Christianity, mm -hmm. um, and you know in particular in this poem. Mm -hmm. Right, and of course we can see that in Johnson as well. Yeah. Well, you know that that was used early on for, as a justification, you know, for mm -hmm. slavery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, this is what you were meant to be. One of the things, one of the um, the areas of protest that I see in the the Lord poem too is mm -hmm. uh, just because you were never meant to live doesn't mean that you won't. Right. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. what's not really being spoken is we can say to our, we can sit our children down and say, and I remember, you know, very practical lessons about where I could and could not go in the city of Chicago. Mm -hmm. and get off the bus before you get to this point or whatever. Mm -hmm. But we can, we can teach those lessons. I mean, they're, they're vital, they're necessary lessons now yes. uh, that you're not, so many people are fighting against your survival. Mm -hmm. But then what uh, the poem's not really talking about, but it's kind of silently saying is that we're also going to teach you the lessons of that survival. Yes. Okay, so mm -hmm. while there are people, you know, fighting for, you know, we're gonna teach you to survive, so you're you're constantly pushing against that, yes. and we're going to teach you to push harder than they're pushing you. Yes, you know, so there's an ultimate lesson of life yes. in that poem. Even the normalization of fear is, uh, you know, I wish I didn't have to say this, but this is how we have to live. Yes, you know, yeah. and yeah. this is how we fight that. Yes, and the litany is the solace. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. You know, I think. You know, in terms of the the Dan Is poem, you know, the, the two things in particular that I like about it, that it's, I see it as an a, a epistolary poem, right? It's Dear White America, mm -hmm. this compressed letter, 
right? The epistolary form is a letter, right? Um, and so by appropriating the salutation of a greeting that we'd find in a letter, it is making it a very personal poem, right? In the midst of critiquing white America. And then I just love some of these lines, like the grandmother's hallelujah is only outdone by the fear that one, another of her progeny is always subject to being murdered by the white carceral state, right? And so when you think about the trope of the grandmother, the black grandmother's hallelujah, that is, that's high religion, right? right? There's not too much that excels that, right? To give God the highest praise, when your grandmother does that, it gets no finer than that. It gets, there's no higher accolade than that but that it's outdone, even that is outdone mm -hmm. by the threat every day that your grandbaby, that your baby may be taken out That's right. by the political state. And I think just that juxtaposition of that, that black imagery, right, um, is a protest in and of itself. But I think it just, it just, if you know, if you've heard a black grandmother's hallelujah, <laughs> and you know what hallelujah means within the black worship experience for that to be undercut by the Trayvon Martins, right? The Tamir Rices, the Briannas, right? Um, that is such a heavy indictment. Mm -hmm. Well, it's almost saying too, before you make me lose even that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I, I'd much rather leave. But also the, the language if you look at it as epistolary, yes. um, Danez is not changing the language to make it more accessible mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. people he's writing. There's, there's also a reclamation of not only the language, but even the, um, the relentless, relentlessness of the text brings about you know, kind of a, a preacher thing. Yes. Too. So there's a reclaiming of I'm I'm not changing my language, my my rhythms, mm -hmm. my rituals, any of the um, uh, things in here that I mentioned that you do not understand. That's kind of too bad now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. So while it's a letter to them, it's not succumbing at all to any of the things that they think that they've taught us mm -hmm. to do. And in fact, it's even rupturing it in the last two lines, right? If we look at the how the last two lines are broken. Right, this would typically be your salutation. Right, right. And it's cut off, and then you get hours flushed to the left, right? And we're out. And we're out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we're out. And we're out. All right. Patricia, we would love, you know, not to, for you to maybe read some of your own poems. Um, and just, you know, I think, you know, you definitely have some things to say. Um, you know, you know, thinking of you know back to Lord, you might as well speak. So, we would love for you to, <laughs> um, <laughs> to bless I, us with some poetry. I'm. This is we were just talking about salutations. This is really interesting. I I wrote a uh, I got a request to do a uh, piece of prose actually, mm -hmm. and it was epistolary. It was supposed to be a letter to the current America or something like that. And uh, I started out to do that and they said something to me like, oh, you could do a poem too, but that would be much harder. And I'm really competitive when someone says something like that to me. So I said, I'll do a poem. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a trip through uh, some elements of black history. And um, it's, it's basically almost all salutations. It's called Salutations in Search Of. Mm. Dear floaters, bloated kin, dear flooded necks and reckless leapers manic for the flow. Though you are elegant in flight, your wrecks distress the ocean's floor. The stark tableaus of sliding skin and swarms of slither set to drumbeat in your hollows. This is free, proclaimed by slavers scourge. Do you regret rebutting scar with water? Dear debris, the ocean mothers all your rampant funk and spurts her undulating arms for you. She likes to think that you are simply drunk with purpose. Dear, the voyage never knew your name. You rise in pieces, love to death, at last unshackled. Time will hold your breath. Dear, wild tumultuous, your mouth, dear God. 
your mouth in fevered skirmish with the tongue, denying sound for rope or goldenrod. Dear mouth, still bulging with Atlantic, wrung into its new. Your tangled words are lashed into the back, intending to explain the gritted teeth expected for a flash of rot, the hefted torso or breast, a chain that's wrenched away, the clinging shreds of skin. Dear going to market, beauty on the block, seed driven deep. Dear chartered womb, within you squirms a tendency, a paradox. You trusted voyage, trust to ken, and found your tongue through tumult. Now you need a sound. Dear mute contrivance, graceless drudge, dear hexed, dear wily roots and conjures, dear persist with your existence, flaunting all that flexed and bumptious brawn, dear flagrantly dismissed the writhing in the cottonwood, dear flail and drip, dear runaway who runs the hell away, Dear pray for drooling cur, dear veil of Judas moon, its murmured decibel of light, dear cautious measurer of splay and fury in a heedless star, dear we, dear woman who must now learn to unsay her purpose as a mute machine, dear be that soft alive, dear man whose fevered drum was lost at sea, what nouns will you become? Dear lurch and pirouette, dear flamed facade, dear eye that won't dissolve, dear lynch. Your audience, obsessed with shrinkage, fancies to applaud and whoop, but damn that eye and the suspense and dogged smolder of your wide aloud. Identified, of course, and doomed to swing, you bow to witness your enraptured crowd delighting in your new scene as a thing to do, do not wish to be seen by you. Dear languid rumba, freakish scorch and sway, dear blackened reckoning, dear charred askew, dear stuff of nightmares seeping into day, the fire has died, there's nothing of you there, but still they see the fiction of your glare. Dear Langston, Zora, Louis, Josephine, dear Harlem, their rampaging stanzas, still explosive, whether they are sugar lean pronouncements from a horn, the thrill of stories touting faces like the ones you hallelujah every time they read themselves, or not to be outdone, a pure astonishment of women. Need this nurture and this verb on dimming days, Dear give you back your name, dear higher ground, dear noontime strutter, balancing pisnays and being Negro all upside that town, dear swinger to a thicker harmony, dear everyone they said you couldn't be. Dear migrant on a greyhound, stunned upright or crammed into a wheezing Plymouth or bewildered by the rails soon to ignite beneath your seat. Dear locked and shuttered door with you on both the sides. Dear bound to be more partial to the heat. Folks say the chill in old Chicago knows your bones. The key is birthing your own son and clutching till it walks with you. Dear you, already done, surrendering magnolias, feigning shame at chitlins, holding that amusing gun to your own truant heart. Dear faultless aim, dear northern body scrubs at what it must, that wily scarlet slap of southern dust. Dear edgy citizen, dear crazed Kareen, through multitudes of all the same as you, your skittish eyes outstretch, dear seen, and then, as if on cue, unseen. You knew enough to heed the itchy siren song that cooed you through the rusty yawning maws of factories. Dear often in the wrong direction, dear Chicago digs its claws in you, the rank air gorgeous with disease and pay stubs. Mayor Daly's startling swell, his pocked and blustered face an odd reprise of those you thought you left behind. Dear bell that keeps on ringing, Blues that hit their mark and make you dance all righteous in the dark. Still, dear, still a nigger in all moors of light. Dear bullseye, trees rise up on spindly toes whenever all your skin strolls by. 
dear quite mistake of you, the way you dare expose your neck and walk as if you own a thing. Dear blue on you, and don't you wish there was a ship, one chance to take a frenzied wing into the ocean? Nothing but the buzz of flashers pinning you against the past. Dear suicide, dear bullet in the back, dear in the headlights, you're not tagged to last till morning. You are tagged to crack beneath their weight. And don't you dare believe that any one of them will let you breathe. Dear George, Trayvon, Biana, Bree, Tamir, Alashiana, Dominic, Jamel, Antonio, D'Angelo, Romir, Ashante, Botham, Terrence, John, Chanel, Stefan, Philando, Kentry, Lee, Leilene, Romello, Emmett, Eleanor, Monte, Janisha, Kiki, Alton, Mac, Francine, Tanisha, Eric, Eric, Dominic, Renee, Michelle, Elijah, Nia, Amadou, Akai, Monina, Cortez, Kentry, Sean, Alberta, Michael, Gabriella, Lou, Natasha, Brooklyn, Walter, Lee, Laquan, Ahmad, Mohammed, Elray, Aura, Shane, Richard, Denia, Sandra, Oscar, Blaine. Dear someone who woke out without woke up without their son. Dear damning, dear damn the dawning. Echoes of a knock with no boy crouched behind it, nothing done to fix it. Dear reverberating shock, dear someone flailing, ripping at the air, dear hollow where he was. Dear someone who's obsessed with resurrecting him, who dares believe the muck of bullet hole and bruise will ever breathe as anything but dead. Dear someone loving body on its way to being only body, just that red and syrupy annoyance Hosed away when street decorum says it's time. Dear damn, dear chalk all washed to nothing, dear traffic jam. Dear woman wounded by the things you've heard, dear angry all your days, dear vibing wire on top your head, dear better watch the words you say to white folks, don't make them tired of you, dear wish you'd pinch those nostrils down, that nose is half your face, don't talk too loud, dear stay out the sun, you fool around, get blacker than you are, what you too proud to settle for that ordinary man, gonna be too late real soon, dear press those naps, and don't you tell me that you plan on yelling about that Black Lives Matter mess. Dear, who in the hell do you think you are? Dear, who in the hell do you think you are? Dear someone who woke up without the sun and spun the blues. The singer moaned so hard the record skipped to save itself. Dear, done so wrong. Dear, frying lettuce in the lard. Dear, wonder could a matchbox hold your clothes. Your child's been scraped up off the boulevard. Since then, ain't, ain't been yourself. Do you suppose some rebel yell can find you, hit you hard? Dear someone who has chosen just to rust instead of breathe. Here's how they lie to you. Your child will keep on dying and you must keep clicking play to watch him blue and blue until he trends. Then he's a photograph who laughs at you and rips himself in half. I rip another page in half. Dear, dear, and start again. Dear floaters, bloated kin, dear flooded necks, Dear wild tumultuous, your mouth, dear God, dear mute contrivance, graceless drudge, dear hexed, dear lurch and pirouette, dear flamed facade, dear Langston, Zora, Louis, Josephine, dear migrant on a greyhound stunned upright, dear edgy citizen, dear crazed Kareen, dear still a nigger in all modes of light, dear George, Trayvon, Brianna, Bree, Tamir, dear someone who woke up without a son, dear woman wounded by the things you hear, dear anyone who wakes up without the sun. Well, all right. <laughs> How do we respond to that? <laughs> There's so much there. Wow, wow. It's, uh, it's, I, I thought, is in the middle of that, I said it probably would have been better to read a bunch of separate poems. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is um, in, in the quest to to protest in ways that, I mean, we hear so much 
that uh, you know some people will start a a, par- a protest poem, reading it, and say, "I can't anymore." Mm-hmm. You know. So what are you going to do in your work to actually you're trying to make people read things they don't want to read because we're kind of bombarded. So you, as a, as an artist, as a poet, as a novelist, as a songwriter, you try to look at different forms, uh, different rhythmic techniques, uh, unexpected entry points, just something that's going to pull your reader or your listener in. And before they know it, you have to give them another story, another reason to want to hear the story. Mm-hmm. Uh, besides the fact that they know they should because it's it's protesting something that they too care about. But we're, we're kind of really, um, there's so much wrong and there's protests coming from so many different arenas about so many matter, manners of things. Um, that, you know, especially when you start talking about black folks, for a lot of people, we're way down on the ladder now. There have been so many things that have happened that have just stunned us as a country, you know, so that people's attention, I think, are pulled in all kinds of different directions. And so um, you kind of have to, when I think about doing a poem, it's like, what can I do? rhythmically to hold my listener in place so we you, we wind up going back to more traditional forms and things because people aren't really used to seeing a lot of really contemporary work in in traditional forms so what thank you for that oh sure and what that reminds me of i think that is an excellent tie-in to the final poem in our packet right the ars poetica which mm-hmm. is alexander is signifying on this term, ars poetica, right? And um, I think this, now that we're approaching the six o'clock hour, this might be an opportune time to open the door, the doors of, our, of the poetic church um, for was Q&A. That more, was, was that more than my, was that eight, more than eight minutes? You are good. You are good. You are perfect. Don't worry about it. We are okay. <laughs> I don't think, I, I don't think he went over one bit. I don't think it's just. No, we just want, we just want to make sure that we have time for, for people to, I'm sure there are people who want to engage you on your, on, on the poem that you shared. And then we'd also sort of want to be able to use that time to, to talk, you know, to include Alexander's poem as well. So this, maybe this is just a great time for our attendees to if you if you guys have any questions that you would like to raise, just put them in the chat and I'll pass them along. Dennis and Reggie, you don't have to worry about that. I'll be glad to pass along those questions as I see them. So please, wow. if you have any questions for any for for uh, for Sister Smith, Brother Wilburn, or Brother Britton, please just put them in the, in the chat. There are a lot of ten- attendees. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I think oh. that was just so beautifully in dialogue with both uh, with every everybody we've read talked about so far. You know. Mm-hmm. You definitely got the, really. the oratory, like you know, the black oratory and the um, the performing, the, the performance part of it. You definitely get the survival from Lord, and you know, the, the, the epistolary, the address, the protest from uh, Denise Smith. So you know, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm just struck by that poem. It's just so beautifully haunting, mm. but also. But that's that's kind of where we live as black people, right? Mm-hmm. Sort of in the beautifully haunting, <laughs> um, you know, and the, this sort of you know, the need to address straight on and very directly the, all the things, right, that have gone into shaping us, mm-hmm. right, into creating who we are. So, um, Lip Kweli calls it the beautiful struggle. The beautiful struggle. There is, there is one question that came in. Um, asking about your choice to repeat certain phrases at the end. Uh, this is from Whitney Howarth. Can you tell us about your choice of repeating select verses or phrases in this poem at the end? I found it very effective, but I'm curious what you were thinking when you made your decision so powerful. So uh, what the, the form that the poem was in was kind of a modified crown of sonnets. And the crown of sonnets, uh, you it, it it consists of 15 sonnets and you use the last line of the first and then you repeat that as the first line of the next one and you do that all the way through and at the end the last one is comprised of the first line of all the sonnets so 
the reason you heard that repetition at the end is I was repeating the first lines of all the sonnets I had done before. Yeah, Marilyn Nelson does something similar in-, in with Marilyn the Nelson is the person who, uh, uh, she, we were teaching together in the program and I was following her around like a little kid going, can you teach me to write or can you teach? And finally she just turned full on me and said, go write it, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, she's, she's a master. Yeah, the reading of Emmett Till is just phenomenal. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Jerry Ann has asked a question. Uh, I think that she's asking us or asking you to reflect on the title of the series of Black Matter is Life uh, and uh, uh, to reflect on the title of your poem in light of that title, the theme. So maybe if you repeat the title of your poem first, that would be helpful. The, well, the title of my poems is uh, Salutations in Search Of. Okay, so it, this, the idea behind it is just that none of the stories, none of the letters, if you want to say that, that I began uh, was of any heavier import than any of the others. Okay, so uh, people would like to define, remember when you were going to school and it was Black History Month and the pictures, the same three pictures went up all the time. And, and, and so there's always uh, an attempt to kind of define us by one image or one person, you know, we are Martin Luther King. We're either Martin Luther King or Romacom X, you know, depending on who's doing the defining. Mm -hmm. And and so it it sort of fights against using one event in our history to define us as a whole. So you start to be, and it's kind of me thinking well, this story. Well, no, this one, this one, this one, this one, and going all the way through, and 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 realizing sort of at the end that. Uh, there are millions of other stories that I couldn't even begin to tell, you know, and trying to give the, the listener a sense of that. I, uh, I appreciate that. Many, many people are asking for copies of your poem. They have great appreciation for it. It's very nice. <laughs> they, they really like it. Uh, and, and a lot of gratitude. And then there was a... It's, it's been, it's online. Uh, yes, I see Jess, Jessica Purdy has found it. Thank you, Jessica Purdy, Jess for Jessica's finding it. on the case. Where's Jessica? Jessica's like, I got this. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica wow. is on the case. Uh, I wonder, is this a space to also oh. talk about the, the, the density of the poem and the work that, that poems make us do? Certainly a, a poem like this, the intellectual work that a poem like this makes us do. And I think that that's roughly analogous to Alexander's poem, right? Um, and how do we talk about, I know that when Dennis and I were talking about this poem, it was like, what in the world does this poem mean, right? It's so multi-layered, it's so abstract. Um, and it makes, it makes you work to do the work. And it just strikes me that even a poem like yours that's, Patricia, that's predicated on salut unfinished salutations, if you will, um, there's a lot of work that the reader needs to do. And I think that there's something about abstract poetry or poetry that's deemed abstract um, that feeds into this vicious loop cycle of those who find poetry too tedious as opposed to being pleasurable. And so for me, the work of a poem, the, the joy of a poem, of certain poems, is that they make me work to find meaning, right? There's no easy way out, there's no easy way in. And it just strikes me, Alexander's poem for today is one of those. And I could definitely see how your poem of Salutations fits into that in a different way. Um, but I think it might be worth just talking about that, the, the density and abstract nature of poems, the forms of poems, how we make the form make a poem mean. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't, think that the salutations poem, it's not abstract in the way that I think of ex abstract. Mm -hmm. um, for me, uh, I'm a very heavily narrative poet mm -hmm. in that most of, my, uh, most of my poems are going to tell some sort of story. I mean, I got introduced to poetry by getting up on stage and doing it. So it was very important 
uh, people don't have the poem in their hands. They don't have a book they can take home and look at later. So mm -hmm. you took on this kind of conversational tone, like, hey, I've been thinking about this thing, listen. Mm -hmm. and, and it's kind of like a tunnel of energy. Those stories would come back to you. You know, it was more like a creative conversation mm -hmm. that you were having. Uh, and, and for years, I kind of poo-pooed what I abstract as opposed to concrete poetry. Basically, the way we poo-poo things we don't understand. Mm -hmm. And we just say, well, I'm different. So that, that's a different kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and, and then realizing gradually that as much work goes into that, and sometimes you have to take it a couple more steps. Sometimes you might have to look up uh, a biography of the poet. Mm -hmm. You might have to look at some of their other works. You might have to look at people who, the work of people who influence them, mm -hmm. because every poem has an entry point. It might not be one that's that's banging you over the head, and um, those poems are are often work the, worth the extra work. You know, there's a lot of abstractions as opposed to concrete language in here, but uh, you know, there's a, a lot of work goes into the title. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes the title is what pushes you in and, and gives you a little road to walk, to walk through the poem. Mm -hmm. um, I know for a fact that uh, this poem is it takes a lot of work in that um, there are a lot of things kind of flying through the, you know, flying at you all at once. And mm -hmm. it's something that uh, it's hard if you don't have it to sit down with and, and just, just go stanza by stanza and go. And, and actually, if you look at the copy of the poem, the stanzas are numbered. I just stopped doing that to make it seem like one long thing. Each event, like there's the migration, there's the lynching, there's a, you know, each one is is a numbered stanza, but I felt that it made more sense to keep going and not. And um, I'm not only, uh, I don't write, I'm not only trying to teach people about things that have either, they've either paved over or never took the time to look at, or it's been so long ago, but also it's it's a continuing quest to teach myself not to forget things, you know, to, to kind of stay rooted in my own history by revisiting. And it's amazing to see in a long piece like that, that visits so many things, how many things come back around again. Yeah. And they're almost, yeah. And there are, and, and there's, there's violence in the poem in several, several different forms, you know, um, and that uh, we can forget, we can forget, we can be in our, our offices in our academic settings and, and you know, have everybody patting you on the back and how glad we are to have you on faculty or how glad we are to have you in this office or in this corporation, whatever, and, and forget that there was no straight road there. You mm -hmm. know? And so when a poem is complicated that way, I want, first of all, to, to polish it and write it the best that I can so that you feel that the, the journey is worth the work. Mm -hmm. You know, you know um, and, and with that, a lot of things go in that go into my teaching. You know, if you've heard it before, take it out. You know, uh, always the figure that if you're running to the keyboard to start a piece, 800 people are running to the keyboard with the same idea. What's going to make yours different? How can you stamp a signature on your work that's different from others? And a lot of that is, is front loading. It means you have to do a lot of work before you do the work. You know, but if you're going to ask people to take the time uh, that you want them to spend with the work, you have to prove yourself worth it. So I, I really appreciate uh, you being attentive to the reader. But there was a very interesting question that came uh, uh, from one of the one of the one of the uh, participants, anticipating or feeling the the. The, the power of what you had to say. What does it take out of you to write a poem like this? Do you have to protect yourself? How do you how do you do that? What does it cost you? It's it's hard for the reader perhaps to hear. Although I don't, I I'm, I wouldn't agree with that assessment. But but what does it do to you to to put this out, to revisit those scenes? Well, I had early on. You know, I told you I I started on stage and it was very much a, for a while a recreational activity. My social circle was built up around it. I showed up at the same club every Sunday. We exchanged our work and, and some of my friends now are, are so incredibly close to me because you were saying things that are important to us 
and also talking about changes in our own lives in a way that people had never heard out loud. Uh, and I had done a poem about a, an, an undertaker uh, and how the undertaker's job had changed, how it used to be that he would, would work with a family to bury some older member of the family, but his job had changed because the phone would ring and he would fear that it was someone asking him to prepare a body of a young person who'd been killed you know, in violence. And I did that poem once and I had three women walk out of the room. And it was the first time I realized that we're talking to real people. So when you say something, when you're talking about a child's body being prepared on a slab, sooner or later, you're gonna get someone who's close to that experience. And that made me think about the responsibility in what we were doing in the, in the stories that we're telling. Uh, what stops me sometimes is thinking, well, this is too personal to me. But what keeps me going is someone coming up and saying, I have felt that way, but I didn't know there was a way to express it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so if you keep that in mind uh, and you think that if I don't do this poem because of the harm I think it might do, or if I'm sheltering myself or my audience, the one person who may be in that audience that needs it to move on won't hear it, you know? Uh, and you have to imagine that that person, even if they, you know, if all they do is run home and pick up their own pen, you're trying to grow the community of witnesses. Mm -hmm. So uh, it will take something out of me in the writing and in a, a little bit in each of the readings. But the fact that someone thought to ask that question meant that something in the poem reached them. Yeah. And I don't know where they're going to go with it. I don't know if yeah. they're going to talk to someone about it, if they're going to write something themselves, mm -hmm. uh, if they're going to do more work on something that was mentioned in the poem, you know. And so we, I think all artists, um, the responsibilities that we have now, because people are looking for other ways to move sanely from day to day. Yeah. And we can, we've taken on a lot of that responsibility to get to provide our work as an option in that. One of the, uh, there, there are more questions, just maybe along the same uh, theme about the length of time it took you to create it. Uh, was it done in bursts? Or is it done now? Do you think you still are changing this poem? Are you continuing to write it? Um, uh, it, was, it was done on a deadline. I am someone who waits and waits and waits, and I work really well with an anvil hanging over my head. So the closer the deadline gets, the more willing I am to write. Uh, so I, and I have to keep that in mind once I'm done that it was written relatively quickly. So I can go back in and say, you know, I, one of my rounds of, of revising is for sound and music. So I go back in and make sure that there aren't any words that are just laying flat in the poem. Um, that one I think is finished. Uh, it's finished. Uh, the way you write a crown is you write the last one first. You write the last sonnet first and then you take the lines and move, you know, take the first line becomes the first line in your first sonnet. The second line becomes the first line in your second sonnet. Mm. Okay. And uh -huh. so you were, the only thing that was different in this one, in a true crown, the, the last line becomes the first line of the next sonnet. And I didn't do that. I just worked with the first, with the first lines. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, there's kind of a mathematical thing that happens after you have mm -hmm. that last sonnet written. Uh, and I, I think it took me, uh, it probably took me a day and a half. Wow. But a lot of those ideas uh, were in my head already. And when yes. he said it's supposed to be a letter, but it'd be very hard to do as a poem, I thought, yeah. okay, I think I can, I think I can figure out something to do with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of uh, appreciation. I mean, it's just people just really loved it. They felt the power of it. That's my observation. Thank, thank you all. That's very nice of you. Yeah, it was, I, I thought that the length was so appropriate because what it did is that it, it, the length itself communicated. 
it was it was it was the relentlessness, the never ending nature of the subject of the of the pain of the uh, that that was what it communicated to me. Well, and, something and, some I'm sorry. That's all right. Go ahead. Something that uh, a poet has a lot of a lot of power in the work that they do. It's not only the narrative, but it's how the poem appears on the page. It's as we talked about earlier, whether or not the lines are tight or if they're loose and all that. And and repetition is, uh, you know, when we're talking about it in in the um, a sermon or something, it's all, it's also, I teach a, a class called Evolution of Spoken Word, and we talk about language as persuasion. It's also used in hate speech. It's used in cult speech. It's used in political speech, you know, uh, something, because that allows the listener to walk away with something that reverberates in their head. You know, if you don't walk away with the message, you walk away with the sound of the message. Mm. And there's one poem that I have where it's, it's about a, um, a man who was shot 10 times. And um, the line is, the bullet said, I just had an accident. And I, I do it 10 times, one time per page. So it's the bullet said, I just had an accident. Said, I just had an accident. Said, I just had, so people can feel what 10 times being shot feels like. Mm. I mean, not really, but how, you know, that time in the fact that when they wanted to stop, they wanted to stop and it's not, it's not 10 times yet, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, you have a, a lot of those things that you can do with repetition and spacing and stuff that can help to get your, your message across. I think there uh, were, excuse me, Dennis, go ahead. Yeah. Well, no, I'm just sort of, you know, thinking about, you know, looking at the clock here and, um, well, I, I'm I'm curious now, and of course, questions should keep coming in. Of uh, what do you think? I mean, I, I've I've kind of heard a little bit of Ars po of you giving a bit of an Ars Poetica, um, in your own description of your poetry, and you know what you feel that you do as a poet. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, what did you have particular thoughts about Alexandra's poem? Right, mm -hmm. she says, you know, poetry does or does not do. Um, you know, I'm you know, first of all, I'm really struck, you know. <laughs> Ars Poetica 1002, <laughs> like, you know, there's a, there's definitely a, like, you know, and I, and I looked this up, you know, this is from a collection in which there are about 19 other from American Sublime, there are about 19 Ars Poeticas in that collection, right? So she definitely didn't write 1002 of them. But I think, uh, about, I think she might be saying that every poem you write is basically about poetry <laughs> in some way or another. Yeah, yeah. And like, what does poetry do, right? And like, what is it supposed to do? Like, what effect is it supposed to have? And what is the poet supposed to do? <laughs> like, what is the poem doing versus what is the poet doing? Right. Um, I I thought of um I thought of something and, and Lizzie's a she's a good friend of mine. We were um uh roommates uh during the Kavikanam residency when we were both teaching there. Um. I thought of one thing. I, I had gone to um, to Germany uh, at one point, and what they had done is they had put a group of poets on a train, and they had them go throughout the German countryside, and they would stop at a small town. They'd have the gazebo set up, music be playing, the poets would get off, they'd read, everyone would cheer, they'd go back to the train, and they'd come back. And uh, I was in Berlin when the train came back for the final time, came back home. And the station was so packed, they had to shut it down. And people were coming to greet poets. They had placards with the poets' um, faces on them. They had flags and everybody was, you know, pressed up against the train. And when they opened the doors, they had to pass the poets out over their heads. And I had never seen anything like that. That's the difference between an old country that reveres poets as truth tellers and a new country where poets are kind of, eh, you know, if you have time, write a poem, you know. Mm. And what it said to me was, I think Lizzie's poem, uh, the core of it is how much strength there is in a line, in a stanza of poetry. And that when people, with, um, and I need to, if I, if I get the poem back, I'm going to switch my screens, but that's okay. Because there is something. 
Mm-hmm. Here it is. Okay. Uh, I dreamed a pronouncement about poetry and peace. People are violent. I said through the megaphone, you know, no one's hearing. You know, we're writing, we're writing, we're writing. And it seems, uh, often seems like we're writing in a vacuum. And you're not sure that anyone's really hearing because that's how poetry has been relegated a lot, you know, in our society. Right. And you're saying mm-hmm. these other truths, people do violence to, unto each other and into the earth and unto its creatures. How many poems have come out of those ideas? You know, poetry, I shouted, you know, and then poetry changes none of that. You know, that's what mm-hmm. people would like us to believe, you know, while we're shouting out poetry and people saying, yeah, but how are you going to make our lives better? Mm-hmm. Poetry changes none of that by what it says or how it says. And in the end, you know, I when she says, I spoke up a truth, my ancestral dreams, it's like our, the strength that we have to keep telling those stories uh, comes from our ancestry, you know, uh, comes from my father and, and his father and his father before that, you know, it comes all the way back down to that's how we breathe we tell stories you know uh that's how you know when how we came to believe how we got here creation myth everything begins with a story you know and so the strength that we get to keep telling those stories and and you know lizzie's probably gonna call me and go nope that's not what i meant um the strength that we we get to keep telling those stories over and over in the face of people telling us that the stories are not effective come from our history. You know, we're born storytellers. You know, we we've been uh, we've been uh, resisted before and will continue to be resisted. But the 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 volume of what we have to say and the context will not change. You know, the stories that we tell in poetry will always be our version of the truth that we're trying to get you to see. Thank you so much. What I appreciate about this poem, you know, and you opened, you know, you read like about the first 10 to 12 lines is that the the narrative layers of the poem, right? We think we're getting one poem at the outset and then the poem takes us on this interesting journey between a dream at a rally Mm -hmm. that then becomes this meditation on a relationship between the persona and the father. Right. right? And out of that layer comes the ultimate, or what I think is the ultimate pronouncement around the function and purpose of poems, right? The the erecting and the destroying. Mm -hmm. But how we get there from the outset of a dream, of a dream pronouncement, and sort of going through these layers, there's a dynamic between the persona and the father and the ancestral influence, there's something about this familial dynamic that seems dysfunctional to me. There's some kind of tension around who the father is in this poem in mm-hmm. relationship to the speaker, the speaker, right? Yeah. And how that becomes an outlet for some higher pronouncement that the poem. Right. Well, seems. actually, the poem, the poem itself is showing you what poems can do. Yes. You know, and also. If you are thinking at the beginning, oh, this is going to be kind of some abstract thing about how, by bringing you into that intimacy mm-hmm. with the father, it puts a, it puts the reader on some common ground mm-hmm. and makes the reader do the work to connect, you know, those opening layers of the poem to those deeper layers and then back up back out again. Mm-hmm. That's why Elizabeth is Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I just feel like I want to kind of applaud for your for your for everything that you've given us. You've you've instructed us. You you professors have instructed us in the in the art of making a poem as well as share such a stirring reading. And so we're very grateful. Uh, we have a community poem uh, that we would like to share. Uh, it is written uh, or be read by Roger Martin. Roger. Okay, uh, can you share my Zoom one out so I'm on Linda Warren's Zoom? So if you can put the poem on screen, I can read it from there. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is by uh, Sky Stevenson, Linda Warren, Gail Zachari, and myself who uh, workshopped it out of the Keene Public Library last week. We were never meant to survive, Audre Lorde. 
If we were to walk with you in the darkness of night at the edge of the harbor, a ship on the horizon, what ghosts does she hold that still haunt the full moon? Clock ticking in the background, running without thinking, counts out the decades, those dead and those still to live. Running, running from the fires, running, running, beating heart, facing what's about to come. We turn, turn, looking in and looking out. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Reggie, Dennis, you have any final words that you would like to say or uh, Patricia, anybody have any, you have any final words? I guess there's a, there's a line right in the middle of that, that poem. poem that you just did that did so much work um, I think it was the line about the clocks mm -hmm. because you've got a little poem and you're trying to get it to cover a lot of time, <laughs> right? And so you've got this line right in the middle that does so much work for that. It's just, and it just brings in this, this huge expanse of time. And then the idea at the end that we're looking back and, and, paying tribute as we should to history, but then looking out and looking back again and kind of connecting the truth, you know, that there, there won't be a future unless we continue to acknowledge what came before. So it's this little poem and it's doing, it goes in all these, and, and there's enough in there. So no matter who looks at it, you're gonna get something from it. You're bringing something personal to the table. And well, it also, it also helps when, when you're here to help us see it and hear it. That, that's very helpful. <laughs> I don't know, would you want to read that, that line again? Uh, Roger, I don't know, just that one line. Can you see what it is? It's about I, time and the clock. I would love to see it on the screen. I, I know it's clock tick, uh, but oh, ticking. Clock, clock ticking, oh, ticking no. clock it's ticking not. in the background, running without thinking. Counts out the decades. Yeah, that's the line. Yeah, counts out, <laughs> counts the, decades. out the decades. Those dead those and those, dead and those, those children. Right. Yeah. We also, one of the things Very we nice. worked on was that um, the the god, the Janus god in the doorway. She talks so much about doors, looking in and looking out. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Good job, Roger, Sky, Linda, and Gail. Well, they did most of the work. I, <laughs> I only got two lines. They got the other six. <laughs> yeah. So well, we're very, very grateful to all of you for uh, what you have done for, for sharing. I mean, this is really wonderful. I'm so grateful to you. You guys did a great job. We want to be thankful to our sponsors. Um, uh, and, and let me just read the names of our sponsors so that you can, uh, if you have a chance, patronize them. Uh, Tito's Handmade Vodka, uh, Bangor Savings Bank, Women of the Sea, Throwback Brewery, and our pa partners, Rye Public Library, the National Public Library, the Keene Public Library, and Black Lives Matter Nashua. Thank you all. Our next event is 121-21, January 21st, 2021. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it.